feeling we've got John, Hunt, John Hudson, we've also got James Fodor, you'll we'll hear more about them in a second. Now, in case you missed the memo on the way in, or just in case someone sort of thrust a person in your face and said we're having a debate tonight and you actually don't know what's happening, uh, our topic actually comes from Dostoevsky, uh, and the topic says, if there is no God, then everything is permitted. So we think it's, it's quite a poignant topic, considering that usually when you see debates, they're about bigger lofty questions, such as, if, you know, is there a God, isn't there a God, and, and, and what ends up happening is there's like a flame war, and this is not what we're trying to do tonight, definitely not. Um, this will be a, a very, well hopefully, a very friendly um, a discussion, um, and also hopefully for you guys, um, it, it is definitely not about one side winning over the other, it's about bringing up different points, so that you might be able to engage with these on your own terms and go away, and hopefully, I mean, ideally if you leave here, uh, Thinking about you know, some of these topics and actually going away and reading—that's the best. That's the best of outcome of one of these events. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that things stay on time. So that's, that's, that's my job. Um, so, so to do that, I'm going to give uh, uh, each speaker 20 minutes for their main remark. Uh, at the 15-minute point, you'll hear this, and that's to say that 15 minutes is gone. At 20 minutes, you'll hear a second bell, uh, and so the speakers really need to know that they have to wrap things up. After 21 minutes have elapsed, that's way too long, you'll hear this. <laughs> and, that, and that's to say that you've, you've definitely gone far, far enough. And this is actually uh, to say that, you know, if you're actually going to go that far, then your, your, talk, your, your talk is sort of worth undermining. So you really don't want to go that far, because that will just ruin everything that you've said. Okay, so we've got 20 minutes for our main remarks. Uh, we'll begin with the events, which is John. Then we'll have 10 minutes for rebuttal for either side. Uh, after that, we'll launch into a 15 minutes moderated discussion where basically the, the format will be, I ask you guys, you guys will give a, a, a question, and I'll just posit this to this guy. But we, we will actually filter, so there are a few questions that we sort of want to avoid. Um, stuff like the nature of evil, stuff like the atrocities in the Old Testament. These are cans of worms in their own right, and we kind of want to avoid those for tonight because we feel that they're not going to be constructive for the overall topic. So uh, any burning questions like that, please save it for the Clyde Hotel later on uh, after 9 a.m. Sorry, 9 p.m. Hopefully not 9 a.m. We're actually going to go. <laughs> I'll be really doing my job poorly if we went that late. So we're going to go to the Clyde Hotel after this. That being said, I'm going to read out these guys' bios, these wonderful gentlemen. So for our affirmative, we have John Hudson, who's from Melbourne Evangelical Church. He studied mathematics and computer science at RMIT. He worked as a scientific programmer, studied theology at Moore College, and our past is Melbourne Evangelical Church. He is married to Vic, and they have three kids, with a fourth due in early January. His interests include philosophy, ethics, free will, and God's sovereignty. Um, for the against, we've got the president of the University of Melbourne Secular Society, James Fodor. Uh, he's studying a Bachelor of Science degree at the University of Melbourne with focus on maths, physics and computing. Uh, he's currently president at the University of Melbourne Secular Society, a student club which strives to, pr to promote rationality, scepticism and secularism on campus. His interests include interfaith dialogue, epistemology, effective, altru uh, effective altruism, science communication, emerging technologies, and history. And that's quite a mouthful. <laughs> so, that being said, we might launch into our main remarks right now. I'm going to give John Hudson 20 minutes. Would you please make him welcome? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, thanks very much uh, for coming. Thanks to the Melbourne Uni Secular Society for hosting this, and special thanks to James uh, for his work in organising this. I really appreciate it. Uh, part of me was kind of hoping that this would be the Skeptic Society rather than the Secular Society, just because I've always wanted to go to a Skeptic Society to ask, are you really Skeptic? Like, really, how can I know that you're really Skeptic? I guess that joke was funny in my head. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, tonight we're going to be debating. Uh, I'll just get the slideshow going. We're going to be debating uh, this quote from Dostoevsky: "If God does not exist, then everything is permitted." And uh, this quote has really provoked a significant reaction from a lot of atheists. If you Google "good without God," there's a number of books: "How You Can Be Good Without God," "Why We Can Be Good Without God," "Sense and Goodness Without God," and in a very real sense, they're absolutely right. Of course, you can be good without God. In fact. The Bible explains how you can be good without God. If you read the Bible, Genesis 1, it says that all people are made in God's image. Romans 2, it says you have a conscience that, to some degree, guides you. So if a Christian says to you as an atheist, you can't be good without God, 
then not only can you point to the evidence of atheists that are good with that God, which atheists are quite good at doing, but you can actually say that you're not being consistent with your own scriptures. The Bible itself shows you how and explains how you can be good without God. You can have very strong moral feelings without God. But let me go even further. A lot of people who don't believe in God can be kinder, compassionate, more loving than a lot of people who don't believe in God. And you see these people use God to excuse terrible things. But that's not really what Dostoevsky is saying, is it? He's not saying, if God doesn't exist, only evil is permitted. He's saying, if God doesn't exist, then everything is permitted. You can have very strong moral feelings without God, but can you have moral obligation? Can you say that this particular thing is not permitted? And this distinction is absolutely key. See, a moral feeling is saying, I believe that X is good and I'm going to do X, and I believe that Y is bad and I'm not going to do Y. But a moral obligation is saying, you are obligated to do X, or Y is not permitted regardless of your moral feelings. Now, everyone has moral feelings. It's part of your worldview. But everyone disagrees. So, say you were to go to a culture where you saw where women can't vote, women can't work outside the house, they can't drive a car, and you were to say that, I think that's wrong, we should change it, we should liberate the women from that culture. Okay, sure, but why? If, if the people inside the culture don't feel like it's wrong, you have different moral feelings from theirs, but you're saying more than just you feel that it's wrong, you're saying it is wrong, they ought to be treated as equals, we ought to change the law in that place, even though they don't feel it. Why? Are you saying that your moral feelings are superior to theirs, or your culture is superior to theirs? What gives us the right to say that our feelings about moral morality should trump their feelings of morality? You see, if you're a Christian, or a Jew, or a Muslim, or if you just believe in a God who is a lawgiver, then you have a way of adjudicating between people's moral feelings. I have mine, you have yours. Here is the objective moral standard that we need to adjudicate. So, as Martin Luther King did when he was put in prison, he wrote a letter from Birmingham Jail where he said, how does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or laws of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. Now you may completely disagree with that, you may have a million objections, but at least see that it's consistent. It's a consistent, objective way of looking at morality. If God made the universe a moral universe and he reveals to us what is good, then you can have an objective standard that we need to adjudicate. So if you say there is a supernatural behind the natural, whether it's Plato's world of ideas or Confucius's idea of heaven or Buddha's idea of Nirvana or Yahweh or Allah or Jesus or whatever it is, then it's right to say there is such a thing as moral obligation. But if you say there is no supernatural, then how can you say that there is moral obligation? What standard are you pointing to to adjudicate between your moral feelings and their moral feelings? Or are you just saying that your moral feelings are superior? Now this is a pretty big problem. And over the past 30 years, a lot of very smart people <coughs> have been talking about the crisis that it is for our society. A number of PhDs have been written on this. And a number of sociologists are saying, never before has there been a society in the history of the world that said there is such a thing as moral obligation, but there's nothing outside of this world. You see, every other society has said, there is something outside of this world, a standard by which we can judge our moral feelings and evaluate us. But if we reject all appeals to anything outside of ourselves, then how are we going to decide what's right and what's wrong? How are we going to decide which laws are just and which laws are unjust? I think the single best place to enter this scholarship and, and this discussion that's really been going on for a while is a piece written by a professor of law at Yale by, uh, called Arthur Left called Unspeakable Ethics, Unnatural Law. And uh, it's, it's been very influential over the scholarly discussion for the past 25 years. Essentially what he does, he says once you take away the idea of God, you take away the supernatural, how do you judge between competing moral feelings? If you can't do what Martin Luther King did, if you can't do what everyone's always done, then what do we do? And he goes, all, he goes through all the alternatives that people point to, and, and I'm sure some of you will have some of those alternatives, but he, 
in my mind at least, he just knocks them down. He says there's really no left. He really demonstrates, I think, that without God, we really don't have a basis for saying this particular thing is not permitted. Let me go through a couple of the alternatives for you. So one of them is majority rule. Uh, people say the human race is coming to greater consensus on things. We can live in a democracy where people vote for laws, and if the majority say it's wrong, then it's wrong. This has significant problems, however. Significant. If, for example, when two, 200 years ago, when everyone thought that slavery was okay, did that make slavery okay? If you say no, then ah, you see, you have a standard of moral obligation that is not based in majority rule. And if you had the views that you have today, back then, what basis could you call people to change the laws? What could you appeal to? You couldn't say that everyone knows that human rights are important. They didn't see it that way. Some people say all we need to agree on is that we should maximise well-being, or to put it negatively, minimise needless suffering. Which uh, is quite appealing, actually, if that's the one thing we have to agree on. It's a pretty easy thing to agree on, minimise needless suffering. However, I'm afraid it's really nothing more than a tautology. To say that we should maximise well-being is saying that it's good to do good. Or to put it negatively, that we should minimise needless suffering, you're saying it's bad to do bad. But who decides what constitutes well-being? Who decides what suffering is needless? See, we in the West, uh, most of us, I hope, think that women shouldn't be made to wear head coverings and that women shouldn't have to submit to men. But in the Middle East, they think quite the opposite. They think it's in a woman's well-being that she's made to wear head coverings. You can't just say it's good to do good or it's bad to do bad. Another variation is uh, hiding behind the idea that we can empirically decide what's good for people. So there's a number of people who are doing research as to what's good for people, but the real problem is how do you define what's good? Different people, different religions, different culture define the good life in radically different ways. In radically different ways. If you're going to say, let's just be empirical and do what's good for people, then okay, but the problem is, how do you define what's good for people? Some people say happiness. We can empirically measure people's happiness. If you want to minimize suffering, let's just empirically measure people's happiness and make laws that enable people to be happy. What if we found a society in Mozambique where there was 10,000 people in slavery and we did an empirical study and we found out that they were happier than people in the United States, happier than people in England, and way happier than Melbourne University students. <laughs> <laughs> Would we then have no way of repealing and saying we should set them free from slavery? If you say no, even though they think they're happy, they don't really know freedom, then, see, then you go again. You've got an understanding of moral obligation that's not based on what people think makes them happy. Let me give you one more. Evolution. Some people say we have certain moral feelings that helped our ancestors survive, and so we can look to nature and evolution and live in accordance with that. There's a, a woman by the name of Annie Dillard who tried to do exactly that. Uh, she wrote a book about it, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, which is a Pulitzer Prize winning book. In it, she says this. I had thought to live by the side of the creek in order to shape my life to its free flow. But I seem to have reached a point where I must draw the line. We value the individual supremely, and nature values him not a whit. It looks, for the, it looks for the moment as though I might have to reject this creek life unless I want to be utterly brutalised. Either this world, my mother is a monster, or I myself am a freak. Consider the former. The world is a monster. There is not a people in the world who behaves as badly as praying mantises. But wait, you say, there is no right and wrong in nature. Right and wrong, right and wrong is a human construction. Precisely, we are moral creatures in a universe that is running on chance and death, careerly blinding from nowhere to nowhere, which has somehow produced wonderful loss. Consider the alternative. We are the freaks, the world is fine. Nonetheless, all go have lobotomies to restore us to a natural state. We can leave the library then, go back to the creek lobotomized, live on its banks as untroubled as any musket will read, you first. You see what she's saying? The nature is read in tooth and claw. You can't look to nature for ethics. Richard Dawkins put this point exactly a few years ago when he was on Q&A. He said, I feel that one of the reasons for learning about Darwinian evolution is as an object lesson of how not to set up values and social lives. You see what they're saying? Nature is read in tooth and claw. We may have got here by the strong eating the weak in evolution, but the strong eating the weak in society is precisely what we need laws to guard against. 
And so Arthur Left goes through all these and he just and he knocks them all down. And he says there's absolutely no way to make a cogent argument for moral obligation if there is no God. But we still need laws. So what do we do? This is how he ends. He says there is no way to prove one ethical or legal system superior to any other unless at some point an evaluator is asserted to have the final, uncontradictable, unexaminable word. That choice of unjudged judge, whoever is given the role, is itself, strictly speaking, arbitrary. In the presumed absence of God, each ethical system will be strongly differentiated by the answer it chooses to give to one key question, who among us ought to be able to declare law? Who among us ought to be obeyed by all the rest? Stated that boldly, the question is so intellectually unsettling that one would expect to find a noticeable number of legal and ethical thinkers trying not to come to grips with it, which is what I think is precisely the case. He goes on, at that point you see we are really forced to see ourselves as law makers rather than law finders, and we are immediately led into a regress that is fatally not infinite. We can say that the majority cannot consistently disadvantage any minority, we can say all sorts of things, but what we cannot say is why one say is better than any other, unless we state some standard by which it definitely is. To put it as bluntly as possible, if we go to find what law ought to govern us, and if what we find is not an authoritative holy word, but just ourselves, just people making the law, how can we be governed by what we have found? All I can say is this, it looks as if we are all we have. Given what we know about ourselves and each other, this is an extraordinarily unappetizing prospect. Neither reason, nor love, nor even terror seems to have worked to make us good. And worse than that, there's no reason why anything should. As things now stand, everything is up for grabs. Yet we all believe that napalming babies is bad, Starving the poor is wicked, buying and selling each other is depraved. There is in the world such a thing as evil, all together now, says who? God help us. He's not a believer. But I think he says something quite powerful. And most people are oblivious to this, and part of what I'm trying to do is to wake you up to this. Because when you see this, you see how a lot of people develop ethical theories that are really based on contradictions, full of contradictions. Let me give you an example. There's a, a professor of ethics in North America by the name of Mari Rudy who recently wrote a book called The Call of Character. And uh, in it, she says this, and I think you can see it quite clearly. She says, I believe that all values are socially constructed rather than God-given. That's the starting point, right? But I'm not a relativist in the sense that I think there are, and I do believe that there should be universally applicable codes of conduct that, for example, prevent discrimination. For instance, I do not believe that gender inequality is any more defensible than racial inequality, despite repeated efforts to pass it off as a cultural specific custom rather than an instance of injustice. It would be possible to assert that my insistence of gender inequality violates the traditions of other cultures, and that I'm merely prolonging the legacies of Western colonialism by imposing my Western values on the rest of the world. But final move, I do not believe gender equality is a specifically Western invention, and I opt to uphold the ideal of getting rid of discrimination because it seems like an ideal worth upholding. She starts by saying that all values are socially constructed, except, what, this one? No, no, this is socially constructed as well. Okay, well then, why is your socially constructed value trump everyone else's? Well, it just seems like an ideal worth upholding. I, I just presume that my moral feelings are superior to everyone else's. If you want constant warfare in the world, then go ahead and say this, say, because I'm white, because I'm educated, because I'm fully informed or ideally rational, because all intelligent people know that what you're doing is wrong, therefore it's wrong and it must be stopped. You want peace and you're going to talk to people like that? If there is no God, then what warrant do we have to call people to do justice? There really is none. You can have moral feelings without God, of course, but how can you have a basis to say that this is not permitted? This is why I think that so many atheists are moral relativists, whereas almost all theists are moral realists. They believe there really is good and evil because they believe in a God who can adjudicate between their moral feelings. But without God, what do you do? Now, not all moral sorry, not all atheists are moral relativists. A lot of them see a danger in where moral relativism lies. So Sam Harris, who essentially kicked off the whole New Atheist movement with the book The End of Faith after September 11, he wrote a book in response to this called The Moral Landscape. Uh, when I was doing third year philosophy, I had the opportunity to write a review for The Moral Landscape, and it is by far the easiest book to write a book review of ever. When you're in a book review, you say something that's good about it and then something as a critique. 
In the moral landscape, to my mind at least, Sam Harris says one thing brilliantly and then one thing terribly that a lot of people have critiqued him on. But the brilliant thing he says, he basically looks at moral relativism and just slices through it. He destroys it. He recalls a conversation he has with a moral relativist who says, within moral relativism, you cannot say to a culture or a group that it's wrong to pluck the eyes out of innocent children. You can't say that's wrong. Our moral feelings are just a matter of taste. It's like, I like pizza, I like ice cream, I really like child abuse, murder, rape, genocide, it's just not my thing. He sees the horror of moral relativism, but then he needs a basis for ethics and he goes to science. That's the self-title of the book, as science can determine human values. And this has been heavily critiqued by a lot of atheists, people who are much smarter than me. Basically, he fails to address what's called the naturalistic fallacy, where David Hume put forward, you cannot get an ought from an is. So, for example, medical science can tell you if a certain treatment is going to save or kill, but it can never tell you whether you ought to administer it. Science is completely silent on abortion and euthanasia. In fact, if it wasn't, it would have completely ended those debates for all who hold science as a firm foundation of knowledge. Now, you see the problem here, don't you? If there is no supernatural, if all we have is the natural with which we can observe with science, and we can say more is statements about science as science advances more and more, the natural is like this, the natural is like that, but how do you go from an is statement to an ought? It's a non separate, it just doesn't follow. There's a number of books uh, that are coming out that are basically saying we can't talk about objective good and evil unless we talk about an objective purpose. If you tell me that this watch is a good watch and I go to bang a nail with it into a wall and then the watch breaks, then you say, well, it's not a good hammer. It, what makes it a good watch is if it achieves its purpose, if it can tell accurate time. But if there is no God, then purpose is only ever subjective. It's only what we decide, it's what you want it to be. And so good and evil can only ever be subjective. You cannot get an ought from his. But you can get an ought from a God-given purpose. No one, I think, is more consistent on this than Nietzsche. Nietzsche, in my mind, was the most consistent atheist ever. He based his whole philosophy around the idea that God is dead. For him, that idea that God is dead just shaped everything. And he said, if God is dead, we cannot keep talking about good and evil as if they're meaningful categories. We just can't. He wrote a whole book called Beyond Good and Evil, where he, he pushed this forward. He says, how can you talk about good and evil? Where, who decides what's good and evil? The one who wants power. You're just wanting power and asserting that you have good and this is evil. And he lamented the fact that many people wanted to say that God is good, but didn't think through their worldview into its implications for good and evil. And he writes this, Wake up, you gutless wonders, you people who refuse to think. The traditional God died because of injustice, but when he died, he took any coherent concept of justice with him. You see, atheists can be good without God. They can be very good without God, but you have to not think. Don't think about your worldview too much, or you go with Nietzsche to my next right. Now, let me give you an example of a, a Christian recounting a conversation with a thoughtful atheist on this subject. A Christian by the name of Tim Keller said to a thoughtful atheist, Now, you're also concerned about civil rights, I know, but really, if this world is all the reason we're just a kind of very, very complex germs, on what basis do you say it really matters which germs are excluded? When you talk about right and wrong and justice and injustice, surely you know that's a fiction. Surely you know that if you feel certain things are right and other things are wrong, that's just because your evolutionary biology has programmed you to feel these things are right and wrong, and that's how you survive. Actually, it's a construction. It's all relative. It makes no difference in the end. He says, I agree. There is no right and wrong. There is no fundamental difference between charity and violence. I said, how do you live your daily life? If you think out the implications of your worldview, how do you live? He says, well, that's the point. I have a number of friends who believe what I believe, but the way they get peace and strength is they refuse to think out the implications of their worldview for daily life, and I have trouble not doing that, so I get pretty discouraged. See, if you're a Christian and you think out your worldview, it moves you to do the good. You can only do evil as a Christian if you're not thinking. God tells us to love God and to love people, but more than that, Christ's example on the cross is what moves us to do the good. As a hymn writer once said, to see, to see the Lord by Christ fulfilled and hear his parting voice transforms a slave into a child and you into choice. 
Christianity shows you not only what is good and evil, but it moves you to do the good so that it's not just a duty, but a choice.